Sober Podcast, a podcast about life and recovery through Christ. My name is Derek. Welcome, everybody. To my right, we have Pastor Shane. Hello. Across from me, we have Jimmy James. What's up, Jim? And once again, Pastor Jeremy, <laughs> the, sw- the swanky. The swanky. Oh, nice. What's up, guys? <laughs> Happy uh, Memorial Day weekend to everybody. Um, yes, sir. Yes. Hopefully you got your grub on, but really the main reason, hopefully you sat back and really thought and thanked all of our men and women that have died in serving this country to allow us to have those freedoms. Amen. Amen yes. to that, yeah. Amen. All right, so today we're going to be talking about shame, guilt, and grace. So you didn't say shame. I said shame. It did sound like shame. Well, addict. That's what the skit guys. (laughs) That's what the skit guys did to me in California um, when I was putting the podium up and down. They were doing a skit and they asked my name because I wasn't paying attention. You know, I was reading what was coming next. Said my name. Shame, shame, and they just kept calling me shame during their skit. Man, it was. It was not. It was not fun, man. (laughs) No, it sounds funny though. It was. <laughs> it was a good story. I guess it was. Yeah, yeah it was. That was a great. Story. Christina, story Christina like loved being up there with me. So, so, doesn't she ever? Yeah, she. Mm-hmm. When somebody picks on me, she loves it. Mm. I don't Wait. blame her. No, no, not at all. So, how was everybody's week? Just wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> the week just kind of started. You know, well, course. I'm talking about from last week last to week. this oh, yeah. week. I drove out to Kansas City to watch the Kansas City Royals play the Detroit Tigers. Met my brother out there. That was fun. That's exciting. It was kind of, it was, yeah. I mean, the drive isn't that bad. No. Like, less than three hours. Where did you go? Wednesday night. Oh, okay. So you missed all the lake traffic then? We missed the lake traffic, but we, we got stuck in the lake traffic from the sky. Huh? It, it rained cats oh. and dogs. Oh. Yeah, it was terrible. Oh, like Shane got it, I think. <laughs> yes, that that was an easy one to get. So but where did you eat while you were in Kansas City? We, so there was a miscommunication, right? Because he flew in from Detroit, and boy, his arms were tired, but he had to come from the airport. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm at this place called Joe's Barbecue. It's the the original gas station location, oh, yeah, whatever. Oh, delicious. oh delicious. my gosh, yeah. is that where we went? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's where we all. Yeah, because we I. Ashley bought a disc at the disc store that was around the corner. And uh, we I, we were texting, and he's like, oh, well, you know, how close is it to the stadium? I'm like, well, it's like 20, 25 minutes. Well, can you find anything closer? So I, we found this place called LC's. Oh, yeah. And it was in the hood, and I really, really wanted some of this. They had some spicy green beans and some other mm. things. Their menu just looked wonderful. And then I got a text from my brother. Oh, I'm at Joe's. <laughs> and it was like a yeah, yeah. fifteen minute drive. Yeah, his his brother really messed it up because Elsie's menu, even though he says that, is is only this big. It's not big, yeah. It's it's only this big, but what they do, they do well. Right. right. And their French fries, though. And and when my wife goes, I really want to eat here. You know, I, we're gonna have to go back. Yes, you do. Yeah. <laughs> All right, podcast road trip. We're going to Elsie's <laughs> and the KC. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's it's well worth it. Oh, and yeah. the best part was we're sitting in Joe's, and I'm like, well, gee, Toto, unlike uh, before, you are in Kansas. And my brother's looking at me like, what, we're in Kansas? Yes, How, yes Is it that are. close? I'm like, yeah. Dude, you were a history slash geography major in college, and you don't know this? Well, you know the border between states is pretty wide. It's giant, yeah. Yeah. So like, so long. How far is Missouri? I'm like, like a block or two that way <laughs> there's a road called state line road. state line road yeah <laughs> yeah you, he had to have crossed it and if he was using gps like a smart person they would have said welcome to kansas yes but he's my brother he's not you know you know that's only really google does it um apple maps does not Same. tell you welcome to the next state oh, all never... right no neither does ways i love but ways by the way all of the older GPS systems, Tom Toms and Garmin. I think those all do too. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. But Apple Maps does not. No, no. No, they don't like other states. No. Does Apple Maps notify you of the popo or? Yes. Do they? They do. They do. It does that now when things are in the road. They've updated it quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And I know they were the first ones to put up stop signs and stop lights. Yeah. Um, mm. So that was pretty nice. But yeah, those are okay. I still like it. Um, and it just it's easy to do, but. You know, there's good, there's bad with all of them. Of course. Kind of like different things, but today. Green bubble, blue bubble, whatever. 
Yeah, whatever you may need, but everybody's words on a text message is, in a text message should be blue. <laughs> I concur. <laughs> That's a three-way tie for that one, everybody. <laughs> Get you an iPhone. <laughs> Here, well, let me give you twenty cents to call someone who gives it in. <laughs> Here's the thing. I mean, we can message him right there on that that tablet of his. Yes, it thank will you receive. Grandma. It will receive text messages and I messages from us. So, oh, good. but I don't have it near me all the time. So you're screwed if you really want to get a hold of me. Right. Oh, we're screwed if we try to get a hold of you anyway. So oh, it doesn't man. really matter. Yeah, nobody's been lively on text messages this week. They have not. No. Yeah. Trying to figure out if we we're gonna. I drove to Kansas City. Trying to figure and out if we we're gonna meet tonight. You have a <laughs> and nobody ever responded. Oh, well, and then you texted me yesterday about it, and then I was like. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. And then I had to text you today. So it's like, are we still doing this? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, we Why sure are. We? We've got to get this out to our subscribers. They're you got to remember, addiction never had a holiday. That's right. So we're here to battle against addiction and work recovery. Every day counts. Er day. And it's amazing. Well, er day. <laughs> okay. er day. A lot of people who don't have addiction in their family or in their whatever, who run certain programs don't quite understand that yeah that, I, no, I get it i find that strange that people close we know programs that close on holidays yeah like memorial day labor day they close and i'm like wait a minute you can't or they do team building events right yeah it's not about the newcomers about Let's go bowling so today shame guilt and grace yes yeah. you got the definition for the, what's the definition for shame a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. Mm, wrong. No, nobody's ever done that. Right. You know, I, I not today. And that's one thing I love, man. It, even in church, I will, uh, I'll find myself just always blasting up uh, definitions of words. Mm. I think this past weekend I had four different definitions of the words during uh, during the message. So as, as we we're getting ready, you know, I had to look it up. Guilt says the state of one who has committed an offense, especially consciously. Feelings of deserving blame, especially for imagined offenses or from a sense of inadequacy. Mm. Hmm. All right. Then we'll get into grace later. You want to wait, till, you want to wait yeah. for grace? Yeah, let's talk shame and guilt for a little bit. And Ooh, yeah, the fun ones. Yeah, the... Yeah, definitely the fun ones. <laughs> the ones that drive so many good things in our recovery. Right. Speaking of which, it said, you know, I'm reading a thing and it sort of says that shame and guilt is the fuel of addiction. As long as we keep feeling shame and guilt, our addiction keeps building. It keeps being fueled? It keeps being fueled. So, I guess since Jeremy's getting a Coke and a smile... Why, where you got that why do you feel guilty? So, so why do we feel guilty in the first place? Because we got caught. Possibly, yeah, because we got caught. Doing the thing that we know we shouldn't be doing, but we do it anyways. That's why we're found guilty. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> There's a difference between being found guilty in court and feeling guilty. I mean... Well, and yeah... Well, we get caught, and the first thing we feel probably is shame, right? I'm ashamed of myself for... Getting caught. <laughs> for, for getting caught, yes. Just don't get caught. Oh, my gosh. Derek, we're going to have to duct tape your mouth shut. <clears throat> yeah, who brought him? Jeez. Now, now I see why it took him a little while. <laughs> now I see why it took him a little while. So why, I mean, honestly, so why would you feel guilty? What is there to feel guilty about? Lying. Sinning, because you know you can't get away from God's eyes. Wait, you can't? <laughs> oh, surprise! <laughs> I feel Sin guilty for not being in my daughter's lives for twelve years. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Had so, nothing to do with being caught. No. Nope. Tell us more about that. Well, because I was caught up in my addiction, and it mainly really because of the shame and the guilt that I felt for the wrongs that I had done. I continuously got fueled. It, it truly fueled my addiction on a regular basis. And that it just got to the point, you know, after I 
finally been in my recovery and started working my recovery, I now, after 12 years, I have a relationship with my daughters. And, that, and there's a lot of shame that I felt towards myself for not being in their lives for 12 years, let alone the guilt that I had for not being there. And now I've been graced. Mm. <laughs> that's, oh that's an action right there. I've been that. graced. Seriously. Wow. I've been graced. Where did you go to church this past weekend? I watched it on TV. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> televangelist. So, <laughs> so he just said, I've been graced. And, and I was in a meeting the other night with, with somebody. And they said, you know the way I Christian. And I was like, what? yeah. I'm like, you I know, know I kind of like that. <laughs> the way you know, I Christian. the way I Christian about loving on people. And uh, because they, they were telling me the diverse group of people that were going to be in this location that we're going to be meeting in pretty soon. And um, I'm like, okay, good. The, the more the merrier. I mean, and so she was just wanting me to know that who would be there. And she goes, the way I Christian, it makes them feel comfortable. And I'm like, I really like what you said, the way I Christian, like the way I follow Jesus, the way that I love like Jesus, the way I Christian. Mm -hmm. So I thought mm -hmm. it was different and kind of like he, he was graced. He was, was graced. Yeah. He, he was graced in the way I Christian. The way I, I like what my God does. Well, yeah, your God could do whatever. Yeah. But I, I just, I like when people say something a little different. It's like, you know, that kind of stands out. I like it. Yep. So Any get, other? Get graced, guys. Get graced. I definitely recommend it. Trademark that right now. I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's podcast exclusive. Because, <laughs> All right. you know, we can't say Taco Tuesday anymore. Why? Why? Because tacos are good every day? Because Taco John's has trademarked that. For, and they've had the trademark for 20 years, 20 plus years. No way. Seriously, yeah. Well, uh, shame on them because I got little platters at home that say Taco Tuesday on them. So, and they're yeah, they probably didn't. They're probably not enforcing it very well. That's how what could you? They, you would have to have every lawyer in the world. Yeah, because most people call it Taco. I mean, everybody calls it Taco Tuesday. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But you cannot advertise it as Taco Tuesday, as Taco Bell has. Oh. Out. Okay. I believe that one. Yeah, I bet you they now they might watch that, but just to just to police the Taco Tuesday thing. I've had a guilt for eating too much Taco Bell. Taco you Bell. You should just have guilt for eating Taco Bell. Yeah, back in the day, it was the, it was the shiz though. Well, I understand they they used to make beans yeah. from lard and all that, but they don't do that anymore. Now it's it looks very, like cornflakes. Even even the tortillas seem completely fake. I don't today. go there anymore. I haven't been there. I, I went there last week just because. I wanted something quick and fast, and there wasn't a line. And I'm like, I, I just, I was craving a taco from Taco Bell. Sue me. But I'm really sad that I did it because, yeah, their tortillas are just crap now. So what's it tell you if there's no line at Taco Bell? We have way many more choices right now. <laughs> Taco was, Bell's garbage. But well, still. it was the perfect time of day. It wasn't dinner. It was like between lunch and dinner. So. Yeah, but they've never not had a line. All the way back from when I worked there. Like yeah. when we had to shred lettuce and slice cheese and shred cheese. And oh, yeah. we'd make beans. Stages. Yeah, we, we made beans from lard. You name it. So you still fried cinnamon twist. You know, beans didn't come in a bag and you break it open. It looks like cornflakes that you're putting in some hot water. Yeah, we've always had a line at, at Taco Bell, and now you could go by there and there's no line. It's like, ah, your food must be really, really bad these days. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. any other so reasons? What, shame. Uh, they're feeling yeah. shame for that. I hope. I'm trying to shame them into upping their. Yeah, we know that won't happen. That's not going to happen. No. We have Pacos. Hopefully, people are still listening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as we're talking about Taco Bell and. Oh. And Shane's of reliving his days. This, this is about day when I had to cup the lettuce. Um, I know, old man. <laughs> you had a machine that you just pulled the lever and it just, <laughs> slipped, it just cut everything. I don't no, know you so I had uh, I had somebody this week tell me, "You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done." And I'm like, "Man, it must be really bad." <laughs> I mean, come on, like. Yeah. 
Like, get, get, get over yourself. Like, yeah, we, we all have we all have a story, and it's all bad. You know, we're all in recovery for a reason. You know, I wasn't on a winning streak. I, I wasn't going to the bars and just dropping dropping G's like it was nobody's business. You know, and I had a bunch of friends. I didn't have anybody, and I hurt a lot of people on the way there to the bottom of my my hole. So that's where my guilt, my guilt and shame comes from. All the people that you hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's a that's a tough one to get over. Mm -hmm. And knowing you're doing something that is wrong, sinful, right? Yep. Knowing yep. I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing, and I do it anyway. And don't even care about the consequences of it. I mean, don't care. It, yeah, I don't think, uh, and, and I guess you could put it as don't care. It never crossed my mind that there would be a consequence. Right. You know, because it was all about me. Mm -hmm. What do I need? What do I need? And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago when when I became we or when the selfishness became selflessness. Yeah, the me, we. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every step starts with we, not me mm -hmm. or I. Every step is a we step. Pretty much, yeah. We, 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 all the way over. How do, because Shane, you, you've taught me this, how do you turn your character defects into character assets? And how can you turn that, Ooh, that character nice. defect of guilt and shame into something positive in your life? How do you make that transition? Somebody who, who's just now getting sober for the first time, maybe seeking their faith for the first time, how are they going to get over that? Are you wanting me to truly answer this one? Yes. I, okay. Well, that's why I asked the yeah. question. Well, I, I thought <laughs> you said that you taught me this one. And, and so I figured that you were going to ask somebody else then. But I mean, the first thing we have to do is, is figure out what it is and where it came from. I mean, that's if we don't know where it started, we're never going to end up getting rid of it. You know, so that four step is so important. It's, it's our roadmap to our character defects. And so we get to trace them all the way back to where it is. And, and if we can figure out where that, where that pain most likely first came from that led to the shame and the guilt, you know, that, that we did and all that destruction along the way, we're able to, to roadmap that. And then, um, we have to find a character asset to replace that character defect with. That is something that people leave out for some reason all the time. And so, if my, if my character, and it don't have to be completely the opposite of that, I have to fill it with something. You know, scripture tells us that, that once an evil spirit leaves our body and then we clean that vessel and it, it comes back and it sees that nothing is there, like nothing has replaced that evil spirit, it's gonna go out and get seven of its little homies and come back and invade your, invade your soul with, with worse buddies than he is. And so imagine that character defect of shame and we don't replace it or, or guilt and we don't replace that shame and guilt with, you know, forgiveness, uh, forgiveness of ourselves, forgiveness of others, um, forgiveness for what we've done, um, making an amends for what we've done. If we don't start replacing that character defect, it will grow and manifest into something a lot, lot bigger. Amen. True story. Amen. You know, I'm thinking about that, though, as you say, can you imagine how bad these other seven are? Because isn't there don't pride being an evil asset, and so you gotta automatically think demonic individuals have a lot of pride about their work and what they do, right? And you gotta go get seven people that he gonna actually say they're worse than I am. Yeah, imagine what that's actually like. I, you know, I just thought about that. It's sociopath, weird. huh? Sociopath. 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 Maybe. Sociopath. If I knew what that, if I actually truly knew what that meant, you got a you got a Google machine right there. Look yeah. it up. No, no, not look it up afterwards. So, yeah. so here, here's here's the thing. That, you know, you just said we we keep we do the stuff that we don't want to do, mm -hmm. and that reminded me of my own testimony, where I pulled out where Paul his letter to the Romans, chapter seven, verse fifteen, verse fifteen. <laughs> I do not do. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, that's what I do. Yeah. So so tell me that the Bible is still not relevant today. It's not relevant today. 
and mean it. Oh, no, I can't say. <laughs> <That's not gonna laughs> He's like, happen. I mean it. No. <laughs> but, and, and sort of back that one up, it's, it's really fun to talk about Jesus when he healed the man at the pool. You know, he said, go and leave your life of sin, otherwise it may be much worse. And, right. and we all know that to be true. As soon as we quit addiction for a year or six months, when we go back, mm. we don't start over. We, we pick up right where we were. And the thing that makes this a disease is the way it manifests, right? It, it grows out of control even quicker. So it, it's progressive is the word I was looking for. Yes. It progresses much, much quicker. And whenever we, we have that pause and we go back to it, and that's what even Jesus was talking about back then. You don't leave your life, if you don't leave your life of sin, once you go back, it's out of control. Goodbye. Yeah, it's much worse. Much, so, much worse. Let me go back to uh, what Jeremy had shared, talking about uh, your friend that was talking about, you don't know what I've done. And how many individuals we come in contact with that think that what they have done is going to stop God from giving love, you know? They can't give themselves over to Christ because of what they've done and stuff like that. And as you read back in the first book of the Bible, back in Genesis, when whoops, <laughs> Adam and Eve were feeling the shame for what they did for sinning against God. Right? They they tried to hide themselves with fig leaves, and it even says in chapter three, in chapter three that he even dressed them as he they were you know as he sent them out of the uh, garden. So even in our shame, you know, in our guilt, God's still there to love us, and I think that's a very you know the first shame situation written. Not, I said shame, not shame. I, it's, it's hard to tell the difference sometimes. It, it is, yes. I'm going to blame my mom for naming me Shane when we're talking about shame. You should. Shame. Yeah. So that sounds like provenient grace. Provenient grace? Provenient grace. Mm. So the grace that God gave us before we were believers, before we yet understood um, our salvation is in him. So that provenient grace, grace that we receive from God, from God before we were yet believers. Yep. That's what that sounded like. Yeah. yeah, that's what that's what it was. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's why no matter who it is, what they're talking about, no matter what they've done, we can look at them and say, it's okay. God will forgive you. God will give you grace. Yes. I think that's what's so much fun about listening to testimonies, right? And, and I think we should bring a couple of those on here, whether, I mean, we could share some of ours, um, but do like an interview style testimony, but that's what's so good about them. We get to hear not only God's story of their life, but you get to hear all the things that happened ahead of time, you know, before they were believers and you get to see God's grace all throughout their entire life. And it's such a beautiful thing to witness. And so then when somebody goes, yeah, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. Did you just hear that testimony? Yeah. Did you just hear did you God's hear what grace? That person did, did? did you see that grace all the way through their life? They didn't deserve that. They deserved death. But you know what? God said, I have a plan for you. I love you. I forgive you. And I want to see you live out my will. Sure. Case in point, that who is going to have a, a worse story than someone who killed their own father? Mm. Right? And, mm -hmm. and to come back from that. Right. To serve your time and then now to serve God and going after the one and helping bring people to sobriety and recovery. Yeah, that's it's, such a fun testimony to hear. I mean, it's... It's a fun testimony to hear when you can watch everyone it, go... <gasps> it, but I'm just, I'm talking about like what God has done. It, it's not yes. good to hear yes. what happened back then, but it is so much fun to sit back and go... Oh, Look no. at this amazing God well, we have. If we, I don't know if we touched on. I can't remember if we touched on this before, but how many characters of the Bible were on winning streaks their whole entire life? Christ. What, besides, <laughs> besides Jesus. Are you talking Old Testament then? Yeah, Old Testament, New Testament. Who wrote? Who wrote the epistles? Most of the epistles. Paul. Yeah. What did he do? Well, he was Kill on a Christians. winning streak. He was killing Christians like they were they were right. dying. Yeah. yeah, but he thought but he was on a winning streak. He thought he was on a winning streak. Right, right. But but once again, let's go back to the way I think. <laughs> right. And I mean, and, and and David slayed Goliath, right? This giant, but then Bathsheba, 
is what oh. took him down. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> Didn't you just post something about I that? I did actually. Yeah, I, thought so. I know. That's where I saw Yes. yes. Brown yes. chicken, brown. When I heard that, I was like, yes. Yeah, Especially since awesome. we had brought up the fact that one of the big, biggest things that, free, ah, that brings forth relapse has been money and receivers. relationships. Yeah. Bathsheba's. Now that's what we're going to call them. You, rela- you relapse over money or Bathsheba's? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, he also had somebody killed. So you can have the sheep. <laughs> right. <laughs> Legitimately. And I, I mean, I'm pretty sure he turned out okay. Oh, I don't know about that. Oh, I'm sure he's in heaven waiting he's on us heaven, to come sure. say hi. I would hope so. I, I would well, have. He, but why? Why? Because he repented of his sins. God forgave him of his sins, right? Yes. That's the only reason. It it's did. not because of any good deeds that he did. Did David forgive himself? Yes. That's what I'm yeah, yes. I, I, I believe so. Yes, yeah. uh, and you answered that quick. <laughs> yeah, this is because what self, verse is that? In? Self forgiveness was the absolute hardest thing for me in recovery. Yeah, self forgiveness. I had that attitude of, well, a I was better than everybody else, mm-hmm. so you didn't know what I went through because I'm better than you, right? And so, if I'm better than you, the things that I do are worse than you. That's my thinking, and. I had a therapist tell me, why can't you just forgive yourself? Hmm. Ding, ding, ding. And I, I, I had that same mentality of, you don't understand what I did. But then somebody asked me, Jeremy, what happens when, God forg- when you ask God for forgiveness? What happens? He forgives you. Correct. If I truly repent, what does he do? And what do I have to do? But what do I have to do in return? Once I ask for forgiveness, what do I have to do? Nothing. Right. So who am I to play God and not forgive myself? Ouch. See, and I like the way I was asked it one time as well. Because, I, I mean, I think that's how many, I, I guess if you ask almost everybody in recovery, what was the hardest thing for you to forgive? God, yourself, or somebody else? Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know anybody that's not going to say ourselves. And I had an atheist ask me, so if God has forgiven you, if you believe in God and God has forgiven you and you haven't forgiven you, are you better than God or are you playing God? And that was a tough way to look at it. Mm. So the same way, I mean, right. yeah, are you playing God or do you just think you're better than God? Right. Oh, geez. So That's it, rough. But it's still... It, from an atheist. Yes, from an atheist. That makes it more interesting. But let's go it? back yeah. and without a doubt. Why do you say David forgave himself so quick? Well, I'm not going to say he struggled. He didn't struggle with it because it's it's written that he struggled with it. But it, I don't. I, I just don't think he. I, don't know. I mean, I really don't know. Well, <laughs> all right, good. If I if I could real quick, what I would think he would because you know it even says in there that you know. David was a man after God's own heart. So if he was willing to accept God's forgiveness for what he did. Why would he not David. be able to forgive himself? Yeah. It was just a good question. It was fun because, I mean, you jumped on that quick. <laughs> yep, yeah. he did. Well, yeah. That was the definition of a nanosecond. Right. right. <laughs> I don't think a question has ever been answered so quick in this podcast ever. No. <laughs> so how about this? What, what lies come with shame and guilt? So, so as we're feeling shame and we're feeling guilty, what kind of lies do we tell ourselves? We ain't worth it. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. I'm a we're bad person. Worthy. Do what? I'm a bad person. Yes. I'm don't a bad person. Don't look at person. me. I'm ugly. Yeah. I don't deserve God's forgiveness. Mm. I've there. told myself that once or twice. I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I like that because you're saying now I'm not worthy of God's forgiveness or I don't deserve it. Once again, it sounds like we're playing God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Hey, God, everybody else is, is worthy, but not me. I'm you too imagine bad. imagine what I did? I'm bigger than you. My sins are bigger than you. I think God just sits up there and kind of just chuckles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> What's this? Obviously, he has a sense of humor. There's three pastors sitting at this table. <laughs> Think about so, it. <laughs> so you had that strange look there, James, when I said that. My sins are bigger than you. Could you imagine telling God that? Right. Well, it goes along the lines of, you know, you can't outgive God. 
We're the ones that say you can't out sin God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That one always gets gets me. Like if I know as, as a Christ follower that that's such a, a, a tough one. Can we out sin God? The I'm creator guessing, of the universe. I, I'm guessing we can't, but when does Everything. it become a, a slap yeah. in the face right. and How he's saying, I don't care way? about what you say, I'm gonna live in I'm gonna live this life of sin whether you like it or not. And those are the people so, that are never going to have and, right. and so that's what's funny when we when it's said that we can't out sin God and, and we're we're saying that to a congregation, it's like, wait a minute, we have to be careful. I mean, to me that that's a fine line of saying We know we're going to sin. We're going to mess up, right? We're going to miss the mark. But intentionally living that life, I think, is something different. Oh, this is a slippery slope that we're going well, down. So I, I, let's, I let's won't change the subject. I, I won't go down it. I'm just saying. Yeah. I, I think, I, but I think it'd be fun to talk about one time. But we'll have to leave it certain things out. Well, we would. But just to go along with your point, and and you've said this before on, on many occasions. Do you want someone from the pulpit leading you who is uh, currently an adulterer or currently on a cocaine binge or even a meth? Trigger know? alert. Oh, <laughs> uh, Jeez. Uh, but I mean, no, seriously, that's that's where that comes in. If if we're trying to lead that life and we want to do certain things, then we've got to leave that life of sin behind us. Yes. No we, matter what that sin is. And, and no sin is greater than the other, correct? Correct. Hmm. And it, one of the big things, our heart is supposed to, so when we become filled with the Spirit, when, when we accept Jesus, when we accept Jesus, um, we change, right? We're, our yes. works don't get us saved, but our works show because of we are saved. Mm -hmm. And so it's not lining up with us being saved if we're going to, live that life and and so that's why we say I, I don't i never really like that I, you can't out send god it's true especially for an unbeliever right someone someone that has not accepted christ yet but once we've accepted christ we're supposed to be living a different way and hopefully if you have accepted then let's get back to shame and guilt what's the holy spirit's job in that to make us feel our shame and guilt yeah the shame and guilt that we feel once we are a believer would come from the holy spirit that that nudge inside of us saying hey stupid don't do that anymore mm -hmm. that's wrong see i was i was kind of saying that facetiously but you have a point i was thinking more the devil is the one who's pushing the shame and guilt but no that that's our that's our our conscience you right. know the spirit helps I was us recognize say, wouldn't, it, wouldn't yes. the holy that's spirit be word. more considered conviction that we feel for the wrong that we did so there you yes. go conviction yes, yes. that over shame and guilt. but but conviction right. is you're going to feel shameful about right. it and then you're going to go make it right and you're going to stop doing it hopefully if you feel shame you're going to hopefully go make it right and yes. change because if you don't feel shame you're going to keep doing it I'm going to keep using, I'm going to keep using people, I'm going to keep using drugs, I'm going to keep doing these things because I don't care. Mm -hmm. But once, once that conviction happens inside of us, once we feel that shame happen, we go and make it right. I think it's great that there are uh, people out there leading churches, men out there leading churches who have led a fairly good life, I would say, yeah. right? didn't struggle with addiction, let's say, you know, maybe never had any uh, sexual infidelity. Um, just kind of, you know, I would say pretty much all the way through grade school, high school, college, just straight into the pulpit, right? Then there are people like myself <laughs> who wanted to start off in the pulpit and then just took a quick right turn and then a left turn and a right turn. And next thing you know, I'm all over the place. And I would rather listen to somebody who's been through the trenches and found a way out than somebody who never has. I'm kind of glad you brought that up because I remember back when I was getting interviewed for my job at the church, 
I was asked a similar question to that about the students. What about the student? The worst thing they ever did was maybe look at somebody's paper during a test. And pain is pain no matter what it is. You got to imagine the person that went through life not dealing with addiction, what kind of crap they went through not to go through that part. You know, the battles they had to fight so they didn't go through the addiction part. They didn't go through the sexual immoralities and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, they, they may not have lived the sin itself, but they had a battle that they were fighting on that same note, though. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Just my just, just what would it, How do you lead where you've never been is how I take what you said. You're right. How do you lead somebody if you've never been there? Which is why I always thought it was weird that Catholic priests did marriage counseling. Thank you. <laughs> I, mean, I always thought that was weird. Thank you. Catholic priests do marriage counseling? Yes. Yes, yes they do. Huh. I don't know Especially if they have kids. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> How many of those do you have? Did those ribs mess you up a little okay, bit? Okay, people, the, 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 the words of Derek do not necessarily uh, reflect, <laughs> reflect the, the, the rules, velocity of yes. wake and sober. Yes, okay. So what happened to Derek today? He seems a little... He's a little, yeah. I don't know. He had a water balloon fight at work today. I did. I had a really good day at work today. And, uh, and one of the things that I share you know, with the, guy, with the people at work is I'm not really big on holidays because I didn't celebrate it when I was in my addiction. So... You know, even outside of my addiction, I'm still not celebrating because addiction knows no holiday. Mm -hmm. So I actually went up there at work today, went to work, and actually had a good time with a lot with the with the people there, and really enjoyed Memorial Day for like truly enjoyed Memorial Day for the first time in the last five years. Mm -hmm. Plus, anyways, that's amazing. It was. So I had a really good day today. Good. Good. Uh, Get. Should we get back to guilt and shame? Yeah. Was what I was going to say is how do we how do we battle the shame and the guilt? How do, how do, we, how do we try to get rid of it? I mean, we talked a, a little bit about the character defects and, and going that route, but how do we battle shame and guilt? Scripture. Self-forgiveness. Scripture. Yeah, but getting to self-forgiveness is the hard part. It is. Yes. Getting to that point. Yes, how do you so, get to that? So how yeah. do we get to that point? Scripture. Isaiah 43, 25. I, I am the one who blots out your transgression for my own sake, and I'll remember your sins no more. Romans 8, 1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in union with Christ Jesus. Proverbs 28, 13, If you hide your sins, you will not succeed. If you confess and reject them, you will receive mercy. Hmm. See, I, read that one again. What did I just read? Proverbs. If you Proverbs. hide your sins, you will not succeed. If you confess and reject them, you will receive mercy. So what were we just talking about just, uh, just a few minutes ago? What were we talking about that? I mean, if you're going to keep living that life. Mm-hmm. If you hide those sins, yeah. Yep. Otherwise, we confess them and get rid of them. Right. Stop doing it. Turn from it. Which is why journaling is such a good thing, right? So I, I daily inventory. I really, I've never been much of a journaler, but I've got a couple new pens, and I've got all the stationery and stuff. Are they like our kind of pens? Don't our say. kinds of pens. No, we're not. We're not going to talk about that. Mine are, are more <laughs> Japanese style. Let's oh, go. That's terrible. I found this new uh, YouTube channel called Jet Pens, and it's about it. it anyways. Great refills. I, I actually use them to order some of my refills. So, okay. yes. Yeah. I know we, who they are. We should have them sponsor us, too. But anyways, yeah. So, I'm like, okay, I've got all these pens. And I've got more pens on pens and pens because I've got kind of a pen thing. Yeah. I, I may be a hoarder for pens. I don't know. Is there an addiction there that we need to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> that everyone at this table would have to talk about, maybe. I don't sure. have pens. You no, he, he had a cheap pen, and it fell between my seats in the car. I was trying to bring it to him today. Oh, that was so really? nice of you. <clears throat> yes, I know. But anyways, where was I going? Oh, journaling, right? So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to start journaling. Shane's wife gave me this really cool journal a few years back, and I'm like, okay, I need to start I need to start u- utilizing this mm-hmm. thing. And so I did, and the, <laughs> the first couple of entries were about all these nice pens that I was getting. You know, because I'm like, you know, pens aren't expensive. 
and they're kind of cool, right? Anyways, mm-hmm. although the, your kind of pens are expensive. Yes. But then, as I kept going, it kept morphing and morphing, and I found myself, you know, writing about the things that had happened to me during the day that I felt strongly enough about to, to write down. And it's just, I hate to say it, it's so freeing. Mm-hmm. I can I can write it down and then I can just let it go. I can let go and let God. <laughs> yeah. Were you going to ask something, Jeremy? Because I'm not. Yeah, go ahead. What uh, What have you seen to be the biggest change since you started journaling? The biggest change? The oh, biggest that's... change in you since you've started journaling. More consciousness of what I'm doing throughout the day. Of my actions, my reactions, the things that I'm thinking about, the negative thoughts, as opposed to the positive thoughts. So what I've been trying to do is trying to take anything negative that happened during my day, write it out, and then figure out a way to spin it so that I can get something positive out of that. Whether it was a poor reaction to something or I don't have another example off my but you know make it right right okay. if, if I need to make an amends I make it you know I, I've always been good at that you know when I say something stupid I always when I so case in point something happened at a meeting that I had last Sunday and I took a few days stewed on it I wrote about it and then I reached out to that person and tried to make an amends on what had happened you know, it turned out it was it was a big misunderstanding on both of our parts, so that that was a good outcome. Yeah, I love journaling. I love what it shows us. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it shows us the good, the bad, the ugly, everything in between. One thing that I really like about it is we don't usually write the lies that our head is telling us when we journal. Mm. Yes. Those sure. so so as we're really good at making up these stories and writing these stories if I'm just thinking through things. But as soon as I start to write it, I don't do the same thing. Just the realness comes out. And I'm, I'm able to quit writing those stories. So let me ask you, nighttime or daytime journaler? Nighttime. Daytime. Morning. <clears throat> ah, good. And mostly because as I'm, I'm working throughout the day, I may have a break because I'm waiting for some report to run or something and my journal's right there so I can grab it, I can grab my pens and I can get all geeky with my pens and write about whatever's going through my head. And I do my journal in the morning because that's when I do my daily Devo and I go through my meditation and I write out what I feel God's telling me. I learned that from your wife. <laughs> she, she loves her morning, morning time journaling and devos yes and i like i like to i don't like to go to sleep with all that stuff on me so i just i reflect through my day and and look at my entire day and i journal at night and then i get a better night's sleep mm-hmm. true but, story yeah yeah it, but there's no right way no wrong way i mean the best way is at night but there's no right or wrong well in, <laughs> and and that's today, cool like i haven't really been, i haven't worked all weekend right so today i thought to myself i haven't journaled it all this weekend so as I was eating some lunch I grabbed my journal and started writing some stuff down yeah I love journaling I just do so I think it, it goes good with shame and guilt but what what is grace because we said we're going to look at a definition later I like to bring up something Lecrae great art, artist I love his music he says guilt says you failed Shame says you're a failure. Shame does? Shame. Oh, shame. Says you're a failure. And Grace says your failures are forgiven. Look at Lecrae over there getting all lyrical with it. You right? He's. (laughs) I know, right? I think he's he's a pretty upstanding dude. He's uh, got some kind of prison ministry thing going on. Yeah, I haven't listened to Lecrae in a while. Because, I mean, like his older stuff, he wanted to just stay Christian hip-hop. And then for a while, he tried. 
he almost wanted to leave and go mainstream, and then he, I was told, came back we to the We had to say with his, with his Let the Trap Say Amen album. Lecrae, if you listen, brother, hey, some of the music was good, but hey, you need to go back to where it all began. Mm -hmm. Go back to your roots, man. Jesus. Yeah. Right. Jesus. But what is the definition of grace? Wow. The definition of grace is a simple elegance or refinement of movement or a courteous goodwill. Okay. According to the dictionary that's on the <laughs> interwebs. What is grace when it comes to Christ? That's the key. When we get pulled over and get a ticket, he pays it for us. <laughs> that's grace. No, that's... No. It's oh. mercy, my bad. <laughs> no, I guess, they, yeah, they, if he pays it, but really the thing that you were looking for is if I get pulled over and the guy says, hey, you know what, today's your lucky day, I'm not going to give you one, that's mercy. But um, instead, if they give you money for the ticket, then that's the grace side. Okay. So, yeah. That, I that mean, is the grace, yeah. So, so really, God's grace is usually defined as an undeserved favor. Yes. Right. So the, when your fence blew down, Yes. God's grace would have fixed your fence for you. That would have been an undeserved or he would have, favor. Or he would have had somebody come over that I knew to fix it for me while I was out of town. Oh, wait. That, that did, did happen. I'll be darned. So there you go. That was grace. So was the <laughs> free, unmerited favor of God mm. is grace. The free, unmerited favor of God. I, I love looking at that and just thinking of all the things that we've done or even continue to do and and yet God is still sitting there going, you know, I'm still going to use you. I still love you. And I still want the best for you. <clears throat> I, I do want to read Ephesians. Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 2, made alive in Christ, because this sums it up. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, which we talked about earlier. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. For it is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. And that's exactly what we talked about earlier. So <laughs> it's literally everything we talked about. Right. If, if we're going to combat shame and guilt with the word, I mean, and we, we went over some of the scriptures that you would do, but really first John one, nine, confess your wrongs, right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And, um, I think that's just such a beautiful, beautiful verse to think about when we first get into recovery. And if it's, even if we're not there yet, we can look at that scripture, you know, for the, for the unbelievers, the, the ones that, uh, that we're talking to open up and, and read the book of John. I mean, here you go. Here's, here's first John one nine. So you're not even going to get very far into, into first John, but if, if you go to John, I, somewhere starting in that new Testament, but I'm thinking through of how I started it. And I wish somebody would have started me right there to say, Look, just admit it. Um, so maybe we should take a little break and talk about, uh, let's give us our, our Reclaiming Hope moment. What is that place called? I just said Reclaiming Hope. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. You weren't listening. <laughs> you going to play something? Yeah. So Reclaiming Hope. Recovering Hope is recovery centers where people struggling with substance use or mental health issues and their families can find hope and healing by being anchored in recovery and in Jesus Christ so that the ripple effect will empower and change others' lives, both in the community and the world. 
And um, I think that's one of the greatest things that, that we're talking here about here today is that selfless love, that selfless act. At the end of it, you'll see, it, it was fun sharing my testimony this week. Um, I shared my testimony just up at uh, First Assembly. And at the end of that mission statement, there's a semicolon and then the three dots. And, and so I broke out what the semicolon means with the, uh, with the foundation, you know, stay, tomorrow needs you. It's, it's bringing awareness to suicide and to mental health issues. And those three dots, um, I forgot what it's actually called, but that means- Ellipsis. You know, yes, thank you. I couldn't think of the word, knowing that I sat there and just you looked it up. on Friday. I, I know I did. <laughs> and, uh, I remembered it then. Well, I read from a testimony, remember? <laughs> if I'm going to do it properly, I read. And, and so those three dots are, you know, something that hasn't been said yet. And that to me is you're writing your story. The semicolon is about keeping them alive. And those three dots, what our mission is, is about them creating their ripple effect and who they're going to touch for the rest of their lives. And man, mm -hmm. it's just a, a powerful thing, a, a powerful way to look at it told people it's not grammatically correct with the way it is written with the semicolon and the three dots at the end but it is christ correct so that's what matters in the end cool so reclaiming hopes about the whole family the whole family the whole family i think that's going to be one of the the funnest things to do really is to to love on the entire family. I mean, that's something Celebrate Recovery has always done. And yes. one thing that I loved about the ministry and I still love about the ministry of Celebrate Recovery is no matter what you struggle with, it, it, you may be um, the addict or you may be our codependent, some of the struggles with anger, um, whatever that, that issue is it's that you feel is separating you from God, there's a place for you. Mm -hmm. And we want Amen. to have a place where people could come in and get family therapy not just meetings, Al Anon, Nar Anon, C R A A N A, all of that, but True truly therapy. come in and get therapy. Mm -hmm. Because we need therapy on top of everything else that we've had. Amen. Did you need therapy? Yes. You should still have it, right? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I needed therapy. I still need therapy. I'll um, definitely need therapy. My therapist has a therapist who has a therapist. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> it's a continuum of care, right? And so it sounds like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> It, it, it is a, a pyramid scheme. Oh, no. But a good one, right? Yes, a, a very good one. Jesus is the key, the Amen. one at the top. Actually, it builds a cross and not a pyramid. Therapist, therapist. No? Okay, I thought I'd try. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Hey, we, we all have those days, so. We, we do. He, he was doing so good, too. I still am. It's, so, <laughs> it's not my fault you don't take it that way. <laughs> So what else do we have on, on shame, guilt, grace? I mean, there's so many scriptures we could get into yeah, and just we, start throwing yeah. them out, but we got a lot. I have a question. Yep. What is the results of our faith in Christ? A As, good retirement plan in the afternoon. Yes. <laughs> That's a good one. You said that last week, didn't you? I did. I'm, yes. I'm going to keep saying that because it, it was the best like thing it. that I've heard in a long time. So God shows us grace. We're forgiven. We have faith and we put our faith in him. We start to grow in our relationship with him. What is the result of that faith? Worldly result or heavenly result? I mean, I, I gave the heavenly answer, so worldly you, answer. I mean, not only you, I think the stronger you build your relationship with Christ, the stronger and better you build your relationships with yourself, with others, and with, you know, yeah, with yourself and others. Because it's like a pyramid. <laughs> Whatever, dude. <laughs> so, so you're asking the question, and I think I know where you want to go with it, but I'm not sure. No, um, I'm just asking the question. Here, look, we it's a selfless act is what happens. I mean, we said it earlier. We said it last week, and we'll, we'll say it probably every week. We serve. We serve others. And when we do that, I mean, the greatest commandment says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then the, great, the second is like it, love your neighbors yourself. So we're going to be serving as Christ came to serve. We're going to, it's about the 12th step, right? Going out and making a difference. Yeah. Can't keep what we have unless we give it away. And um, right heart, right motive. 
if we're serving because we get something out of it, then we're still in the selfish phase. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for for me to remember that the the result of my faith is my works, my service. And as a result, somebody else, I show somebody else grace. I show somebody else mercy because it's been shown to me. Mm-hmm. You know, forgive as I've been forgiven. Right. And I do that to somebody else. And it's so important because when somebody gets sober for the first time in AA, I'll use that as an example because it's probably similar in Celebrate Recovery, but we try to get them into service work right away. Start, start, start making the coffee, start shaking hands, start doing something. And it's so important because that does get us out of our head. It gets us out of our selfish desires. Hey, I'm, I'm helping somebody else. I want somebody else to have what's been given to me. So. We just can't force that on them, right? No. Right. Well, you can't walk up and tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, you need to go make coffee? But you can. Well, I see you need <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm speaking more of the snow globe effect. Oh. Uh. We shake them because we want them to have what we have. We want to shake it into them. So it's right. like a snow globe. It's all pretty when you shake it. But you can't do that. But we can, unfortunately. You we can't can. shake something. I think you knew somebody that was going through that last week, don't you, Shane? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> was there? Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about it, though? Because I think these are the good stories that people um, need to hear. <laughs> they need to hear our struggle and then our solution, right? Experience, strength, and hope. Um, we can't lead where we've never been. And maybe somebody could kind of relate to what you went through. Which incident are you referring to? So, so there's a whole bunch back to back. So back. let's let's talk about the um, the one with the gentleman that you didn't have kind words for. Um, uh, yeah. Was it me? No. <laughs> no. No. Um, so I was working with an individual this week and. He decided to break all of the rules and had a medical, he stopped breathing. He died, he overdosed. And my, I was so angry, so angry at the time because I've been struggling with him now for several weeks. And the words that came out of my mouth were just keep him dead, just keep him dead. And it was one of those things I told Shane. As soon as it came out of my mouth, I just kind of wanted to grab that back and just kind of. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, it doesn't yeah, work. That that's way. not going to help. <laughs> and I immediately knew it. I immediately knew it. And and do I really feel that way? No. But I was so angry because <laughs> I had given this gentleman, this individual, every opportunity. I mean. Everything recovery related is at his fingertips. And he decided to basically throw it on the floor, stomp on it. And give you the finger. Exactly. <laughs> and it's not that it's not that I it's not that I didn't care, it's that I care too daggum much. And so I struggled with that because and then Shane's the one that said you, you can't treat everybody like a snow globe. <laughs> I can't. You well know? not only that, but you know, Think about it this way. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Yeah. No, you can just drown it. You, well, right. And I think it's the scary part. You know, when I started, when I first got into recovery on the on the, the counseling side of it, uh, one of my first clients passed away of an overdose. And then shortly thereafter, another one. And then shortly thereafter, another one. And it all within a six-month time period. So I'm new to recovery and now three people within a six month time frame passed away. And I took that personally. And, and so I struggled with that, you know, and I, I've talked to, to my mentor a lot. Uh, and just everybody knows it's Shane. Uh, <laughs> but I, I struggled with that. And it's like, I, do I become desensitized to it? Are you asking if you should, or you're asking, do you ever? Should I become desensitized? That would make you not a human. Because that was my question to you. Yeah, and you can't. It's like the short, sweet answer, yeah. And if you do, what kind of person, what kind of counselor will you be 
if you do become desensitized to it. But because then you're not going to care about them. And that's that's true. And, and that's what I told them. But in uh, being a counselor, it, it's rough. You try owning what other people do. Right. So I can love you. And, and if if I desensitize myself, that means I'm dying a little bit to you. I'm hardening my heart to you. I'm not feeling. And I need to feel, but I need to do that with boundaries in place. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I don't, I won't be effective. I won't be able to be used by God the way that God wants to use me in those situations. But there's a lot of counselors out there that that's what they do. They will, they will turn those emotions off. And to me, I think we can... We can lean into those emotions and, and love from them and make them turn into good, healthy emotions for us. Derek? Derek? Yeah, I've kind of been, I don't want to say that I, I work on practicing that, as you're sharing about, you know, shutting off the emotions, but I've told just today that I obviously have compassion. I'm just not compassionate to my clients. I want to see them get better. I want to do everything I can to help them get better, but I'm not there to be their friend. That's not the job. I don't believe that's the job I was given. And that, and I really try, you know, almost to the full, I don't want to feel I'm desensitized to them because I do care. I want to see them. I want to see nothing but the best for everybody I come in contact with. But? But I'm not going to sit there and tuck them in at night and cover them up and say everything's going to be okay. You're not going to coddle them? Or, not you know. not a it'd be a cold day in hell before I actually have to coddle somebody. I'm okay. just being honest. I'm just not that kind of guy. And I may be wrong. And if I am, I really hope somebody comes out and tells me. Besides, Oh, no, just, you're that, that guy that you're describing. Yeah. No, I know I'm that guy. Yeah. But I'm saying yeah. if I'm wrong for being that guy. Oh. I think know? there's only one person who's going to be able to make that judgment call. Well, don't put it on me because I don't think I am. No, it's not you. It's, <laughs> it's no one at this table. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's so let's like, uh, let's well, go back to you. He's at the table, actually. He's here. He's yeah. here. So, so, so let's go back to you, Jeremy. <laughs> yes. The three people within a six-month period. How did? What was the feeling? I didn't do enough. Was one of them. Okay. Um, I did ask why because they. And they literally just like just like this guy, they had all the tools, they had all the opportunities, and they just didn't do it. And I'm like, why, why, why did you do this? Like, why? You had the help, and all you had to do was let go. So did you feel guilty? Yes. How did you get rid of that guilt? Talking about it, journaling, and seeing it from their point of view and not from my point of view. So saying, okay, I gave them all the tools to put in their toolbox and I hate that, but I gave them all the tools to put in their toolbox and it wasn't my responsibility to make sure that they were using them. I can't work harder for their recovery than them. True story. And that's when I started realizing that. I've heard that a thousand times before. You don't have to work harder for your recovery. Don't work harder for your recovery than them. I would never tell that to my clients. I would never say that. But I'm not going to work harder for them. I'm going to give you all of the assignments and all the work to do. And I will encourage you until the sun comes up and the sun goes down. But after that, it's all on you. Just like, I, I mean, I, and I always tell them this too. I don't want you to enter the gates the same way. I don't want you to leave the gates the same way you enter them. I just don't. Sounds like a chip night. <laughs> but I bet you you do work harder at their recovery than a lot of them do. Because I know your heart. I'm too passionate. Uh, I don't know if you could ever be too passionate, though. Yeah, that's what I've been told. <laughs> well, I get it. But that's where that desensitizing comes in. You can't do it. That means you just have to love differently. You have to lean into it. And you have to realize that. You can't own their mistakes. You can't er- own their decisions, but I'm going to love you in spite of mm-hmm. your decisions. If you stop working the way that you work, you will not be fulfilled. You will not be fulfilling God's purpose. And so you, if you get desensitized, you might as well just leave the field. Mm-hmm. Now, he already came in a jerk. 
<laughs> right. And he he's going to stay he's, a jerk. For but, those for those listening, he's pointing at Derek. But <laughs> yes. But I know he loves him to death. But but he has those boundaries put in place ahead of time, right? So he's he is who he is, and he loves him. He teaches them. He does what he needs to do. And and I'm just playing with you. You're not really a well. You are a jerk, but you're not a yeah. Don't show me. Real, if I can, real quick, what really got me into that heart space is I shared with you one of the first uh, PSAs I did with, at the, in the, uh, the Kirk, uh, Kirkwood office. The gentleman that I did had, had passed away, and it hurt. I thought I did something wrong. You know, I even contacted you and your wife about it because it was like, dude, this is the first guy I actually put my time into, and now he's gone. Mm-hmm. And it was, all I heard was, Keep doing what you're doing and reach out to the other ones. There's still people there that need your help. And that's where I, and that's where I've come to realize I had to cut off that feeling part. Not to say cut off the feeling part, but But just be careful. What am I, with trying, that. To, what am I trying to say? And then well you know what I'm you know what I mean. You're so not what am I trying saying to say? Cut off your feelings for people. You're saying hanging on to those feelings. Right. right, like the, the, the feelings of shame and guilt because you think that you did not do enough to help this person. Right. But right. that's, you know, like we're kind of saying here, that's not, it's not on you. That's not your side of the street to clean up. But it's, it's, it's hard. It, it, that's a fine line when you're talking about somebody losing their life when you feel like you could have did more. And so that, that guilt is heavy, but we have to learn that your decisions are your decisions. I've been called to love you, and I'm going to love you. I'm going to give you the tools. What you do with them is your, is your deal, and I'm still going to love you. I still want you to be successful. And I think as soon as we start to desensitize ourselves where we won't have that guilt, we're not being, we're not truly discipling people as Christ has called us to do. Right. I think we're half-stepping things, and, and we might as well leave whatever we're doing. So, so, yeah, just be careful that the heart don't get hardened towards people and know that you're going to be hurt, and that's okay, and it's okay to mourn. It's okay to grieve because we're going to lose a lot more than we're going to win. But, but when we see the fruit from what we do, mm-hmm. imagine what that – have you seen that, that fruit is just unbelievable? I mean, it's, it's plentiful. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, so I'll go to a meeting. Uh, one of the nights out of the week, I go to the meeting and I see three of my clients, one actually there, two of them, one from Illinois and the other one coming in from Florida to join the meeting in the group. So they're not flying in. No, 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 no. They're uh, zooming in. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's a zoom call in to the meeting, but (laughs) the fact is they're still attending that meeting from Florida, you know, and that, so when I see things like that and I'm working, I hear that, you know, I'm not compassionate enough to, clients i'm like well these guys seem to be doing just fine you know but they're actually wanting to hear and listen what i had to share and work their recovery they weren't just trying to be sober and think you know just you know give me a hug and everything's going to be okay they realized there was work that had to be done and so we have to also be careful not to own god's part i guess like we're not changing them god changes them and we're not failing them they're failing themselves and, and that's, it's fun to see that the work that we've done produce fruit, you know, that, that God went in and hopefully we're a good enough example for them that, that they wanted to change their life and, and have a little bit of what we have, God. And we just have to always be careful not to own his part, to own our part. And I don't know, I'm, I'm just, I'm happy that we get to do what we get to do. Very much. What? Nothing. Nothing. How are we doing on time? We're uh, we're about done. We're about done. We're about yeah. done. Okay. Yeah, we're about done. So, what do, do we have? Any closing thoughts on shame, guilt, or anything? Anyone? My my closing thought would be, don't just like you know it said in Ephesians, don't don't hold that stuff in. Tell somebody about it. Confess it to confess it to, to God, and let go of that stuff because there's no reason for you to be holding on to it anymore. So, if you need to talk to somebody, you know, what is what is our website? What is our, what is our email? What is our email? Awaken Sober Podcast at gmail Yeah, shoot us shoot us a, an email or. It's I, in the it's down in the show notes. Okay. 
Yeah, it's on there. It's it's all over. He's been doing good. So he's been doing a great job. What were you going to say, D? Bill, just uh, bring up this last scripture here at Psalms 103.12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. All that guilt and shame that we felt coming into this, giving it over to him, surrendering to him, they're gone. He's, he's doing them out. He's not dealing with them anymore. There's no reason why we should be. Amen. Hmm. James, anything? No? No, that's I mean, I pretty much I said mean, yeah. I it, to say. it was a fun time. I loved it. I it would is. say if, if you find yourself in a place where you're feeling that shame and that guilt, just ask God to, to take that from you, to roll it out of your life like he did the stone to the tomb. That's one way to look at it. He rolled that stone away, and uh, Jesus just has done remarkable things. So if you're, if you're living that life of shame and guilt, just remember, God's grace is sufficient Amen. for you. What about Jeremy? Amen. He's already shared his Should I continue? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm right. sure. Well, I guess let's just uh, say our goodbye. Say goodbye. Yeah, right. Hey, that's about all the time we have for tonight. Thank you guys for joining us at the Wake and Sober Podcast. If you have any questions, feel free to share them with us at the Awaken Sober Podcast at gmail.com right like us on youtube follow us comment hit that little bell so you know when the next episode comes out and be sure to share with your friends follow us on spotify we'll have more in the near future thank you guys for joining good night have a good night everybody talk to you next week toodaloo i was just jamming man (laughs) come on close it i'm gonna keep dancing you gotta say good night